hawks. God has been speaking to me through hawks, red-tail hawks. A pair of hawks nested at the ranch this summer. I loved to hear their cry. I'd be working on something or other, and suddenly from way up high, I'd hear the call of a hawk, and I'd stop to watch them. It was as though they lifted me out of the mundane, lifted me up, raised not just my gaze, but the gaze of my heart. There was also the hawk that God led me to up on the bluff when I thought I was looking for shed antlers. Another hawk swooped overhead as S'mores and I were riding one afternoon out in the sage. He was for me a symbol of God's presence, of his freedom and beauty. A symbol of my heart, God said. And then today, God gave me a magnificent hawk perched up on the hill above our house. They only come and rest on that snag this time of year for a week or two as they migrate through in the fall. I felt God move me after our time of prayer and journaling to go outside. And as I did, I felt him move me to go up or look up. And there was the biggest hawk I have ever seen. I was afraid that he wouldn't stay long enough for me to get the spotting scope, but he did. And far longer than that, I watched him for about 10 minutes. There was a moment when he looked straight down at me, and his eyes almost seemed as if they were the eyes of God, God looking down on me. I asked him what it meant. My love? Remember, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, Psalm 24, 1. God is speaking to us all the time. Sometimes he uses words, other times he uses dreams, and he loves to use the ever-changing, unfolding beauty and drama and presence of his creation. We're in week three of a four-part series on walking with God. This is the Ransom Heart Podcast, and I'm Alan Arnold. Today we're going into what it looks like to walk with God in the midst of crisis and struggle. How do we have breakthrough when it looks like it's all about to break down? I think you're going to find this fascinating. Here's John Eldridge reading from his book, Walking with God. The Accident When I came to, I was lying face down in blood. I could hear someone speaking. After a moment, I recognized the voice. Stacy was asking, Are you all right? Am I all right? My nose is broken, I said. I think my right wrist is, too. I can't tell about the left. I was doing the inventory your brain naturally races through when you've been hurt. I can move my legs and my arms. My head hurts, but I think it's okay. My nose is definitely busted. It feels huge. And there's something wrong with both wrists. I must have gotten thrown. It was Labor Day weekend. The boys were back in the woods building a tree for it, so Stacy and I decided to take a ride. We were headed up through a lovely, though narrow, aspen draw when my horse started acting skittish. I stopped, patted him on the neck. Everything's okay, buddy. There's an old wood pile in this draw, and sometimes the horses don't like going by it. So, just as I'd done several times in the past month, I sat there to give s'mores time to figure things out. Let him see for himself there wasn't anything waiting to get him in there. Every other time we'd come to this place, he had calmed down in a few moments and we had walked on through. But not today. S'mores spooked, wheeled on his hindquarters, and took off like a bottle rocket. He's a big horse, more than 16 hands, with long legs, and let me tell you, we were moving fast. Stacy's horse followed suit. I started to come out of the saddle on the initial turn, regained my stirrup, and thought, hey, maybe I'm going to make it started trying to slow him down, but the next thing I knew, I was waking up face down in a pool of blood. Stacy was thrown too, bruised, but not badly. I was a mess. But so much adrenaline was pumping through my injured body, I didn't realize how much pain I was in. We had no idea where the nearest emergency room was, and I wasn't sure I needed to go. Stacy started calling neighbors. Should I even go? I asked God. I don't want to go. I hate hospitals. I hate being in need. Maybe it's not too bad. Go, God said. (laughs) It was a good thing I did. The broken nose wasn't too big of a concern, neither was the fracture in my left wrist. 
but my right wrist was dislocated, and we were about to find out that it was a pretty serious injury requiring surgery. I would be in a cast for nine weeks. Six of those weeks, my left wrist was going to be in a cast, too. This was going to change a lot. Now, I know what you're thinking. Did he even ask God about the ride? Is that the lesson of the story? I don't remember if I did, actually. I've struggled a lot trying to sort through what happened that morning. I know that during my morning prayers that day, I had prayed against the thief of joy. I had never done that before. That's suspicious. I know that there was a lot of warfare around the ranch that weekend. I think we might have asked God about the ride, but I know we didn't ask where we should ride. Pause. That's a really important part of listening to God, by the way. Ask the next question. So often we get an answer to the first part of a question, but we fail to ask the second half. We hear, yes, take the job, or yes, sell the house. But then we need to ask, when? Today? Next week? Next year? Don't just get a first impression and then blast ahead. It might have been good for us to ask, where should we ride? But it's a little late for that now. And you can really chase your tail on this sort of thing and get nothing but all tied up in knots. When it comes to crises or events that really upset us, this I have learned. You can have God or you can have understanding. Sometimes you can have both. But if you insist on understanding, it often doesn't come. And that can create a distance between you and God because you're upset and demanding an explanation in order to move on, but the explanation isn't coming. And so you withdraw a bit from God and lose the grace that God is giving. He doesn't explain everything, but he always offers us himself. Besides, it happened. Now I'm all busted up. If there are lessons to learn from what happened, I trust God to reveal those in time. What I'm watching for now is what comes next. What will I do with this? What will God do with this? How am I to walk with God now? Right now, what I'm aware of is how shaken I am by all that happened. I realize that my life is going to be radically changed for some time. I'm heartbroken as I start realizing the losses that come with this. I've lost archery season and all that time with Blaine and the guys. I can't tie my shoes, let alone pull a bow. Sam and I have been rebuilding his first car together, and now that's lost for who knows how long. I won't be able to help. I really want God to heal me, and I am very aware of how much I don't want to be in a place of need. My whole approach to life has been built on be tough, need nothing, push through. I hated wearing that little hospital gown, the one that doesn't really tie in back, I insisted that Stacy put my boots on for me when it was time to leave. As we drove home from the emergency room in Steamboat Springs, my cell phone began to ring. Stacy had called a friend on the way to the hospital to ask for prayer. Word got out, and friends began checking in. I was completely blown away by the amount of love and concern, and I noticed something. I have a really hard time being loved. It's hard to accept a fundamental reorientation of one's approach to life. The old ways are so deeply woven into our personalities, so grounded in our core assumptions, so rooted in our wounds and in all that has worked for us over the years, and there is nothing like a crisis to expose all of it. So long as our old ways are working, we really aren't open to looking at them, let alone giving them up. And then something like this happens. Now I'm backed into a corner. This disruption is going to be far more than physical. Whatever else may come out of this, I want to be transformed. Love is pretty central to life, after all. I don't think it's a good idea to miss out on love. I can't drive. I can't open a door. Opening a bottle of juice is impossible. So is cutting a steak. Oh, man, I'm going to need help with everything. I can even button a button. Whatever else might be going on, this accident is thwarting my entire approach to life. I see it now. My approach to life is fundamentally based on attack. That's how I live. I attack life. I get up in the morning, 
and I attack the day. Whatever needs to get done, whatever worries I may have, whatever fears lie underneath, I attack. But that is not the life I want to live. And so I pray. I come back to your love, God. You said my love. I want to live a life that is based on your love, rooted and grounded in your love. It's hard to say clearly enough or with enough force just how important this revelation is. Words like paradigm shift or epiphany just don't quite touch it. As we drove back down the highway from the hospital, me stretched out in the back of the Suburban, I prayed, God, I give you permission to rebuild my personality based upon your love. God, I am really struggling with this. I know God loves me. Why wouldn't he just do this for me? As soon as I got home from the accident, friends came over to pray. We prayed for healing, earnestly, fervently. For the next several days, we pray for healing. You see, the emergency room called in a hand specialist, and he was able to reset the dislocation. But now I need to go in for surgery, and I really don't want to. I want God to heal me. I have faith that he could. I believe he would want to. But it didn't happen. I go in for surgery tomorrow. Is the church impotent? I mean, so many people praying can't get this done? Why is that? Why can't we heal, Jesus? I am really disappointed. I've lost archery season, lost the joy of hunting for this year. I can't get my hand on Sam's car. I'm just really, really disappointed. I wanted God to come through, not just for my heart, but for the hearts of my sons and my wife and so many other people. My healing would have been such an encouragement for their faith. What am I to do with this, Jesus? I know that there are many people hurting way more than I am. But still, I asked you for healing. Jesus, I need your help with this. Come to my heart in this. And all the while, in the midst of struggle, I know I have to be careful. This is the vulnerable moment. This is when agreements seem so reasonable, so inescapable. We have to be careful with our hearts in this very moment when we are struggling deeply. I know I can't give my heart over to anything. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Proverbs 4.23 The spirit of the passage is this. You've got to be really careful what you give your heart over to and of what you let in your heart. In the midst of this struggle, I know I cannot make agreements with anything not discouragement, not unbelief, not striving, not resignation. It would be so easy to make a subtle agreement down inside like, why bother? Prayer doesn't really do anything. I don't want to go there. I don't know what all God is doing or why it seems at times that our prayers are impotent, but I know this, the only safe place for my heart is in God. Understanding or not, That is where I have to land. I've been through enough hard things to know that eventually there is light on the other side. In the meantime, I know we can shepherd our hearts. We have to. No agreements. Until God becomes our all. How do we best understand life? I was meeting with a young woman the other day, talking through some hard times in her life. I don't know yet how to make sense of my accident or the fact that both my arms are now in cast, but life goes on and I have to go to work. So I was meeting with this young woman who was dealing with some distress of her own when she asked me what I thought was the truest way of looking at life. My husband thinks life is just hard. I'm feeling that it's sort of random. We're not really good for each other right now. What do you think? Oh, the beautiful timing of God. I am suddenly aware that someone else is in the room. There's a sort of pregnant expectation in the air. What would I say? What do I believe? God wants us to be happy, I said. But he knows that we cannot be truly happy 
until we are completely His, and until He is our all. And the weaning process is hard. Even though I was playing the role of counselor in that moment, I was feeling that God had arranged the whole encounter for me. I went on to say, The sorrows of our lives are in great part his weaning process. We give our hearts over to so many things other than God. We look to so many other things for life. I know I do, especially the very gifts that he himself gives to us. They become more important to us than he is. That's not the way it's supposed to be. As long as our happiness is tied to the things we can lose, we are vulnerable. This truth is core to the human condition and to understanding what God is doing in our lives. We really believe that God's primary reason for existence is to provide us with happiness, give us a good life. It doesn't even occur to us that our thinking is backwards. It doesn't even occur to us that God is meant to be our all and that until he is our all, we are subhuman. The first and greatest command is to love God with our whole being. And it's rare to find someone who is completely given over to God and so normal to be surrounded by people who are trying to make life work. We think of the few who are abandoned to God as being sort of odd. The rest of the world, the ones trying to make life work, they seem perfectly normal to us. After the accident, I was really disappointed that life was suddenly beyond my grasp, literally. The forecast for the next several months looked bleak. But do I ever feel this disappointed when God seems distant, when I seem to be losing my grasp of Him? What is it with us? I am just stunned by this propensity I see in myself and in everyone I know, this stubborn inclination to view the world in one and only one way as the chance to live a happy little life. Now, don't get me wrong. There is so much about the world that is good and beautiful, even though it's fallen. And there is so much good in the life that God gives us. As Paul said, God has richly provided us with everything for our enjoyment. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 17. We are created to enjoy life, but we end up worshiping the gift instead of the giver. We seek for life and look to God as our assistant in the endeavor. We are far more upset when things go wrong than we ever are when we aren't close to God. And so God must, from time to time, and sometimes very insistently, disrupt our lives so that we release our grasping of life here and now, usually through pain. God is asking us to let go of the things we love and have given our hearts to so that we can give our hearts even more fully to him. He thwarts us in our attempts to make life work so that our efforts fail and we must face the fact that we don't really look to God for life. Our first reaction is usually to get angry with him, which only serves to make the point. Don't you hear people say, why did God let this happen? Far more. Then you hear them say, why aren't I more fully given over to God? We see God as a means to an end rather than the end itself. God is the assistant to our life versus God as our life. We don't see the process of our life as coming to the place where we are fully his and he is our all. And so we are surprised by the course of events. It's not that God doesn't want us to be happy. He does. It's just that he knows that until we are holy, we cannot really be happy. Until God has become our all and we are fully his, we will continue to make idols of the good things he gives us. We're like a child who throws a fit because he cannot have a toy or watch TV. In the moment, he could care less that his mother adores him. His world is out of sorts. He doesn't see that his heart is not in the right place. He needs his mother's love and comfort far more than he needs the thing he's made an idol of. Whatever else might be the reason for our current suffering, we can know this. The Lord your God is testing you 
to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. Deuteronomy 13.3 We are so committed to arranging for a happy little life that God has to thwart us to bring us back to himself. It's a kind of regular purging, I suppose, a sort of cleansing for the soul. I have to yield not only all my hopes for this fall, but my basic approach to life as well. And of all tests, I do not want to fail this one. Now, I am not suggesting that God causes all the pain in our lives. I don't believe he pushed me off my horse to make a point. In fact, I believe he saved my life. But pain does come. And what will we do with it? What does it reveal? What might God be up to? How might he redeem our pain? Those are questions worth asking. Don't waste your pain. Making Room for God After the accident, I felt as though God wanted me to quit drinking. Now, it's not like I drink a lot. I have a drink now and then. And I hate the feeling of being drunk, so I never drink to excess. But some of you are thinking one drop is more than the good Lord would be pleased with. Why, then, did Jesus turn water into wine when the supply ran out at the wedding reception? Why did he go so far as to provide between 120 and 180 gallons of it, and really excellent wine at that? The act itself was an act of approval, a celebration. Let the party continue. So let's get this straight. The Bible does not condemn drinking. Drunkenness? Yes. Drinking? No. However, it had become to me something it ought not to be. Sometime earlier this year, I noticed I was drinking too often, or more precisely, drinking for the wrong reasons. I'd come home exhausted and frazzled from the day, and I'd turn to a glass of wine or beer as a sort of refuge and relief, a way to find some peace. Some people use food or television. For me, it was alcohol. And that's not good. I began to see it as reaching for joy. Joy in a bottle. Joy within my grasp. Yikes. This does not have a good future written on it. And so God gave me a kind of grace to give it up, to make room in my life for him. It was really that simple. I noticed that when I came home frayed and weary, what I wouldn't do was simply take a few moments to be with God and ask him to comfort me, to be my refuge and my peace. I decided to try that instead. And so, something I've enjoyed over the years is gone now, and I have no idea if or when it will return. What I notice is a kind of spaciousness now in my soul in the evening, room for God. A Sanctified Life Remain in me, and I will remain in you, Jesus said, John fifteen four. A simple command, it seems, and yet we overlook it. If Jesus must tell us to remain in him, then he seems to be assuming that it's quite possible not to remain in him. In fact, the common life is a life lived separate from him, and that is a dangerous place to live. We cannot enjoy the fellowship of God or his protection or all the benefits of his kingdom unless we remain in him, that is, live in him, in our day-to-day lives, vine and branches, shepherd and sheep. Stay close. Stay with me, Jesus is saying. An old saint said to me years ago that the devil doesn't so much care what particular thing he gets us to fall prey to. His primary aim is simply to get us to do something outside of Christ, for then we are vulnerable. I want two things that are mutually opposed. I want to live a nice little life, and I want to play an important role in God's kingdom. And it's in those times that I'm trying to live a nice little life that I make decisions and choices that cause me in small and subtle ways to live outside of Jesus. 
The shepherd is headed in one direction, and I'm headed in another. Not to some flagrant sin, that's too easy to recognize. Instead, I'm simply wandering off looking for the pasture I deem best. I don't even think to ask God about it. I do wonder how much this played into my accident. We pray over our horses every time we ride, bringing them under the authority of Jesus Christ and under the kingdom of God. We bind away fear and rebellion and bring the peace of God upon them. And we did pray that morning. But sometimes when I'm praying, I can tell it's not really working. I have a sense that it hasn't broken through yet or hasn't been fully effective. After all, even Elijah didn't get it done in one whack. All this means is that we need to pray some more. Do it again. Seven times, if necessary. But sometimes, I don't want to pray anymore. I just want to get on with things. I felt like that the morning of the accident. It was a sunny day, and I was tired of praying. I just wanted to go for a ride like any normal person. That is a very dangerous way of thinking. As Christians, we don't get to live a normal life life. And accepting that fact in all the details of our lives is what allows us to remain in Jesus. I remember a friend admitting something like this about his family vacation. I don't want to ask God if we're supposed to go to Hawaii this year. I just want to go. And so you can see how the collision of our desire to live a nice little life and our need to remain in Jesus can bring about a sanctification of our will where all things truly are subjected to Christ. But there's something we need to be honest about. Part of us doesn't really want to hear what God has to say. I know something of this. I don't ask because I don't want to know. If I know what God thinks, then I'm faced with the decision of whether to follow his counsel or not. What was initially just a quandary or a moment of confusion becomes an issue of obedience. I don't want that sort of clarity. Furthermore, I don't want God messing with my approach to life. And so we come back to holiness. To ask is an act of holiness because we are seeking to follow our shepherd, to live by faith in him. Then we are faced with a choice to obey what we hear and our holiness is deepened. This nice little life thing is really in the way. More than anything else, this is what causes me to simply wander off on my own looking for greener pastures. I'm thinking about how Jesus said, I don't do anything except what the Father tells me to do. This is what we're after. It requires a desire to live in God and a willingness to subject our wills to His. This is where we are made holy. I'm not describing the abandonment of our desires, that posture of the soul that says, with resignation. Just tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. That's the easy way out. What I'm describing is a heart that is present and engaged to God, bringing our desires to Him, yet submitting our wills to His, genuinely trusting that what He says is best. That is how we come to learn to remain in Him. We're going to pause there, but we'll be back next week for the conclusion of our Walking with God podcast series. I'm Alan Arnold, and you've been listening to the Ransom Tar Podcast.